all these things for me were always an uphill struggle. Nothing came natural. I had to work really hard at it, a lot of practice, a lot of repetitions. What's going on, everybody? Welcome. You're tuned into Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 644, with my guest today, Sensei Angel Lemus. I'm Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host here for the show. I founded Whistlekick, well, because I love traditional martial arts and I wanted to get more involved in the traditional martial arts community. And that's why we do all the things that we do. And you might be saying, well, Jeremy, what are all the things that you do at Whistlekick? Well, if you go to whistlekick.com, you're going to see. And you know what? If it's your first time going over there, you might be overwhelmed. We do a lot of stuff. In fact, sometimes my friends write to me and they say, how do you do all these things? Well, with a really awesome team. I want to thank everyone who's involved in big part, in little part, mostly for the support. Because if it wasn't for the support of all the martial artists and the friends, the people who care about our mission to grow and retain martial artists in martial arts, we wouldn't be doing any of the things that we're doing. If you want to support us, tuning in is honestly, it's the number one thing you can do, just showing your support in that way. But if you want to go deeper, why don't you go over to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, get on the newsletter, check out some back episodes, and maybe find one that you think a friend of yours would appreciate. Share it. As the show grows, so do the other things that we do, like our Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash whistlekick. We bring you exclusive content, some behind the scenes stuff, some merch, some bonus material, a lot of really cool stuff going on over there. And how do I know it's cool? Well, one, because we're making it. (laughs) Two, because when people join the Patreon, they very rarely leave. And that says something to me. So I figure we're doing something right. Let's talk about today's episode. When I talk about traditional martial arts and how much I love it, how strongly it's impacted my life in a really positive way and connected me to amazing people all around the world, you know, people like today's guest, Angel Lemus, who's doing some really cool stuff in his own right for traditional martial artists. And we have a great conversation. You know, we kind of bounce all over the place, as you might expect on this show. But the thread throughout is a quest for knowledge, a quest to find more and whether you want to think of it as answering a question or scratching an itch i think those are both really apt analogies and as we go through in our conversation honestly i had more questions than i had answers not about our guest but about my own training and that's something that i really think is a hallmark of a good interview on this show if it leaves you asking questions about your own training and what martial arts is for you I think that's a good sign. So let's go. Angel, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Hey, thank you. It's an honor to be here. Hey, it's an honor to have you. I love what I do. I love that I get to talk to martial artists from all over the place doing some cool stuff. You're doing some cool stuff. And I know, I know we're going to get into it and I'm excited. But I want to, I want, I want to talk about the, the past stuff. You know, we don't always run a, a, a real, timeline you know it's not always chronological what we do here but uh let's rewind the tape you know let's if uh if your life was a comic book you know what what would that first issue be you know when you discover your uh or your martial arts powers um an 11 year old boy (laughs) is being pulled by the ear by his mom go to enroll in a judo class because he is chunky and overweight, bottom heavy, and uh, he's very insecure. Um, So when he was young, he was always made fun of his thick legs by the other kids in the physical education class. Uh, As you know, back in, well, when I was in elementary school, it was, uh, you used to wear these very short shorts for your physical education class. So, you know, Mm -hmm. everybody has skinny legs and here I am. But the moment I stepped on the judo mat, people couldn't foot sweep me. It was very easy for me to foot sweep them. So I discovered my strength. Mm. Did she know that was going to be a strength in that context? I don't think she knew. I, wow, that's I, pretty fortunate. I think it was because the you know it was uh, the craze of the kung fu theater movies of the time. You know, and of course, you know, she saw me watching all those movies as a little kid and. 
you know, put posters on the wall. And so I figured I got to do something with this kid. <laughs> Super cool. Did she have any understanding of the differences between different martial arts? Did she select judo or just say, you know, here's a, here's a thing, here's a martial art? I have no idea how she found it. Um, it was just being offered as an after school activity. Like she just told me one day, you're going to go to judo class. And I said, what? <laughs> <laughs> Were you, you were resistant then? I wasn't really resistant, but I was just surprised and I was terrified. Of? Of uh, just doing that because I didn't think I could do that. Because I was, mm. like I said, I was a very, um, very insecure little boy. Okay. And what was that first class like? Do you remember? A lot of apprehension. Uh, not knowing what was going to happen, but the teacher was a very kind person. Uh, the atmosphere seemed not to be uh, overbearing or a lot of pressure. Mm -hmm. And as I just went through the moves and learning how to fall, and it took about maybe two or three classes before I really started to discover my strengths because of the low center of gravity, the way mm -hmm. I'm built. And then I started to realize, hey, I'm pretty good at this. And I can uh, I can do things that I never thought I could do, and I'm proving to myself that I'm pretty good at it. Two or three classes. So at 11 years old, in the span of you know just a few hours of training, you went from anxiety to some confidence. I mean, that's a pretty big turnaround in a short period of time. It sure was. Um, I mean, of course, you, you have to consider when I say I was pretty good, that's from a total beginner at 11 right, years old, right. but compared to the other kids, I was doing things that looked much closer to what the instructor was expecting us <laughs> to do uh, because they just couldn't make it work on me as well. Yeah. What kind of an impact did that start to have on you? Well, did mm -hmm. it change how you felt in, in gym class in PE class? It sure did. Um, I started to not worry about being insulted or being called, you know, fat legs or whatever the kids were saying at the time. Uh, it, it started to change uh, how I perceive the external stimuli, whether good or bad. I just started, I started to care less about that because I was just completely obsessed with uh, judo. I just uh, consumed it. I started to look at videos and I started to buy like Black Belt Magazine and Karate Illustrated and I just started consuming this stuff and I became engrossed with it and that that just kept my attention on the art and the process and not on what everybody else thought. Mm -hmm. When did you how do I want to ask this? So if if you had some awareness of martial arts films, you knew that there were different kinds of martial arts maybe not definitively but you recognize i'm sure at some point hey you know they're punching and kicking each other we're not doing that in judo but uh, i would imagine go ahead sorry well no, yeah i mean i i did notice um uh, maybe th those specific differences you know and there was karate and there was kung fu and judo and jujitsu and things but i i wasn't that you know um educated as far as like well you know, it, it one comes from specifically from China and Japan and Okinawa. It was all like a big blur of uh, geographical uncertainty at that point. Mm -hmm. And then you start immersing yourself, reading magazines and and maybe reading books. And you, I would imagine, went pretty deep, right? That that age group when they find something that they like, they are they are all in. I remember myself as an adolescent, as an early teen, if there was something I was into. That's all that mattered. Oh, absolutely. It, it did consume me. And so what was the result of that immersion? Well, what it, stuff were you digging into, becoming interested in? And, and um, let, let me ask a question a little, a little bit differently. I found over the years of the show that when we talk to someone who goes all in at that age, it tends to have some pretty significant foreshadowing of where they end up a decade or two later. And I'm wondering if that's true for you. It's an interesting question because I, there's no way that I, I, going back to my early teen years, I would never have thought that I would be where I am today 
having been doing this stuff nonstop for 49 years. Um, but it, but it did consume me to the degree that all of a sudden I started to save pennies and quarters and dollars here and there so that I could, um, collect the mass sum of $120, which was the fee for the life membership for the United States Judo Association. So I was so engrossed with it that I didn't want to pay the $20 a year. I wanted to become a life member. And when I did collect it and I became a life member, when I received my little plastic, you know, three and a half inch by two inch card that says you're a, a Judo uh, USJA life member, uh, it was number 1128. It was just uh, fantastic. Uh, I loved it. Talk about a good deal. <clears throat> oh, yeah. You made out well on that bargain. Yep. <laughs> when did things start to, let's say, open? Because I know that what you do now is broader than judo. So at some point between then and now, you became acquainted with other things. You started to do other things. What did the genesis of that door or doors opening look like? When I got to high school, there was a police officer assigned to the high school um, through the Coral Gables Police Department in Miami, Florida. And um, he was a judo person. And because he was a police officer, he, he had practiced other things uh, in addition to whatever they teach at the academy. Uh, and because um, he found out I did judo or somehow we found each other, uh, he, we would get together and talk, uh, you know, here and there. But he started to invite me to help him as a partner in his women's self-defense classes. So he would hold these classes from time to time at a community center. And uh, so I went a few times and I, I just was working as a partner. Uh, and so because I could fall, it, he could throw me and it's a good example of, you know, finishing techniques or whatever. And, but then I started to notice, oh, the, the strikes and these things and these kicks are pretty cool. And we don't have those in judo. I mean, I, I knew they weren't there and they existed, but I just didn't really practice it at that time. Uh, so that kind of got me thinking. And then, um, be, because I was connected to that youth center, uh, participating in his classes, there was also a judo class that started there with a Japanese judo champion who was in his early 20s. And the guy was phenomenal, who came in and did a class for a few couple of years. And he didn't speak any English. But because I was so involved in this youth center, um, this was around the time I was like 17 years old. Uh, there was a gentleman named Manny Saavedra, who was a student of Peter Urban, uh, the guy, you know, the Mm -hmm. of Peter Urban, uh, USA Gordu yeah. fame from New York. He came to Miami, he moved back home, and then he started to teach at that youth center. So I was doing judo, and right after, there was this karate class. So I said, hey, you know, maybe I should try this. Uh, these guys all look pretty good at what they're doing. So I, I, I joined that class, and thus my karate journey began as well. What was that experience like, starting to incorporate karate into what you did because you you'd been all in on judo you uh, uh, for a teenager to buy a lifetime membership to anything i mean that that's that says something it says something about the way that you valued judo did your exposure to karate change how you saw judo oh it didn't change it it just reconfirmed the value of it for me because mm -hmm. Of course, I was terrified because, like, I didn't know how to punch and kick, and these guys would do kind of like what you see in, you know, sports type of sparring, and I really didn't know how to spar. I just knew how to close in and grab. So what would happen is, is like, if I kept my distance, of course, you know, they're throwing punches and combinations, and my reflexes weren't yet built to be handling that kind of stuff. So I did what was natural. As soon as they threw a punch and I could sort of parry it and grab, I would grab them. And then they didn't, at, at that point, they shut down because these guys had no judo training. They had no, no close quarter type of work. So it was so easy for me to, don't get me wrong, they kicked and punched me all the time, <laughs> which was natural. But every sure. once in a while, I would grab them or I would just 
I would just cover up, you know, like a turtle and just walk into them because that's all I knew how to do as a 17 year old. And then here's these guys that are either my age or, you know, in their twenties and thirties, they all have like fourth and fifth pounds or whatever. Um, but every once in a while I would get in there and once I grabbed them, they didn't know what to do. And uh, I owned them. That must've felt really good. It, it certainly did. <laughs> I mean, that that's, you know, here we can, we can kind of plot these points on your, on your timeline. Yeah. It's, you know, very uh, quickly mm -hmm. at 11, you go from feeling kind of bad about your legs to recognizing that they are the source of your power and you train for a few years and now you're, you're taking out fourth and fifth downs at 17. You must've been flying. Well, it, it, it was interesting, but, but I was still very insecure because I mm. just, uh, you know, um, it, it was like starting over and these people were so good sure. at what they did from my perception of their, their, the point of where they were in that particular style with what they were doing. Uh, but it, it, all these things for me were always an uphill struggle. Um, nothing came natural. I had to work really hard at it, a lot of practice, a lot of repetitions. Um, but, you know, it, it never occurred to me like, oh, this is too hard. Maybe I should give up. It was just like, this is just how it is. You know, you just stick with it. Um, and uh, it, so it's just been my philosophy. I, I I don't know what the what happens when something sticks to you. Like if you're if you love music or piano or 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 you know whatever activity you do, at what point does it become part of your DNA that you that you say to yourself, "I'm going to do this the rest of my life." But at some point, it, it never occurred to me that I would ever find a reason to stop it. So it was just the thing to do. Uh, just was it was always there. Mm. What did your mom think at this point? She was she was happy that I was involved. Um, you know, uh, they they supported me. Um, well, I talk about support. Oh my god! Uh, so I was training with my judo instructor um, at one school, and then I found out that he lived like twenty miles away in another area in in, in South Florida, and that he had another class uh, later on. Uh, so this is now in junior high. I continue with him through the whole time. So I'm now. In I think it. I know where this is going. So I say, hey, you know, uh, what about if I go to the other class? Is that okay? I said, like, yeah. He said, fine. But uh, geez, I don't have no way to get there. So it turned out that he drove. I drove with him twice a week, and he would drop me off at the other junior high elementary, which was like two blocks from where he lived. So he would drop me off there, and the school is empty. And it's just few janitors and you know people this is like an after school activity so we would get there maybe like around 5 30 in the afternoon and i would just do my homework and then around 6 6 30 the other kids would start coming in we'd roll out the mats and i would have a class my parents did this for four or five uh, four or five years where they would drive the 20 miles and pick me up twice a week so i have them to thank for just their support for doing that that's huge yeah that's huge when, when we talk to anybody who spent time training as a teen, competing as a teen, you know, the parents, whether it's explicit support, like what you're talking about, where they're going out of the way to do things, or even just kind of implicit support where, you know, they're offering encouraging words. I mean, it sounds like you had quite a routine if you were able to do that much training and get your schoolwork done. I mean, that that's... That requires a lot of dedication. It did. Do you remember any conversations that they had with you? Were they concerned about that level of immersion in an extracurricular? I don't really recall any kind of concern or that. They just knew that I that I loved it, and uh, they just supported me in it. Um, the funny thing is, is that once I once I started to get to know the kids over there. There happened to be these two brothers that I, you know, I became friends with everybody in the class as, as, as normal. But it, it turned out that that all of a sudden, you know, one day they uh, said, why don't you come over for dinner? So instead of my teacher dropping me off at the high school, at the junior high, he dropped me off at their house, which is like still two blocks away. So I went over there and I had dinner that night. And then it turned out I had dinner the next day, the next day. So for, for a couple of years, 
he would drop me off at, at my friend uh, uh, John and Rocky's house, and I, I, I sort of uh, was their dinner dinner guest for two years and two or three years in a row until uh, you know th- that whole episode ended. Uh, so it was it was really rewarding in that sense that I I bonded with some really just wonderful friendships and I competed with these guys at the local uh, uh, state and we even went to the USJ Nationals in Illinois one year. So it, it was just a really wonderful uh, episode of camaraderie and and a friendship that developed through martial arts and that has always been one of the factors that I mean the martial arts by themselves are fascinating but the bonds. And the camaraderie and the friendships and the brotherhoods and sisterhoods that you develop, uh, I strongly believe, that, well, definitely are sometimes stronger than yeah. blood. Yeah, for sure. Mm-hmm. For sure. Yeah. You know, it's funny as you're, you're talking about having meals there repeatedly. <clears throat> I haven't thought about this in a very long time, but there was something similar. I, I had a friend getting off the bus at my house and my mother would you know, make sure we both had a meal. And then uh, she also trained, but would, would drive us to karate. Hmm. I haven't thought about that in a very long time, but it, it forges, you're, you're right. There's this uh, collective upbringing within the martial arts. And we see parents who are, are in these communities, you know, just kind of grabbing and, and raising kids. And you know where I see it a lot now is in competitions. Mm-hmm. You know, parent who barely knows this kid, but has had two or three conversations with his other parent over here, sees the kid doing something that they know they shouldn't and just grab him and say, you know, in, in, in ways that you wouldn't do that outside of a martial arts circle. You'd yeah. be afraid of getting sued or, or whatever, you know, and, and it's, you're right. It's the bonds, these bonds that we develop from trusting each other so much you know throwing each other around punching each other in the face i mean without trust you really can't learn at a deep level oh absolutely imagine the 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 injuries and the damage that we, we would have um inflicted upon each other and you know they did happen from that time but sure um you know you have to have that, that kind of tremendous um trust and the the element of the of the budo was there not the jutsu so much um and, and and that was a, a I guess a, a great psychological lesson uh, to learn to develop trust in others, uh, and and I think that's probably one of the reasons why those those friendships and bonds were developed because it, you know it really all starts with trust. Where you you may not trust other people, but you know you trust your dojo mates and your and your martial arts uh, buddies. Sure. So we we've talked about up to seventeen. I'm assuming you you left high school at some point shortly after. Uh-huh. What was that transition like? I had a weird high school experience because my dad is an architect, and um, the construction and the industry and all of you know it was it was like right after the the, the Watergate thing. Uh, there was an opportunity for work in Caracas, Venezuela, so I finished my high school year, my senior year, in an international high school in Venezuela. Mm-hmm. So I had an interruption in my training um, for about eight months where I finished my second half of my senior year. Uh, but that was a very interesting uh, uh, scenario because there were other kids that were doing martial arts down there in, in this international high school. So it gave me an opportunity to sort of compare what people were doing from different places and and some of them local to, to that country. Um, so it was just sort of an interesting thing, but it wasn't like I had a teacher and I was training regularly. Uh, at that point, I was doing what kids were doing in 1977, where it was uh, the disco craze. There was a lot of partying and clubs and dancing <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, but uh, it was interesting. But uh, when I when I moved back to Miami, Florida, then I, I reconnected with my karate group and uh, and I continued. You know, this was about 19... 19- 19, uh, uh, 1979 or so. Okay. Wow. You know, we, we completely missed the part where you were a kid training at a time when kids really didn't train. I mean, you had kids around you do, doing judo, but, you know, just from, from what we've picked up on the show over the years, there were very, very few kids training in the early 70s. 
I guess, you know, everybody was watching uh, Kung Fu movies and everybody was sort of mm. like doing their goofy stuff at home, <laughs> mimicking. Uh, you know, I, I distinctly remember that I was um, with a group of other kids from, I forgot what what age is level, but everybody was sort of like an, uh, an armchair expert saying, well, a blue belt in karate could beat a brown belt in judo and a kung fu white sash with, and it was like everybody was just talking about all this stuff. And it was like, it's so silly to think about it now, but there was sort of like this national obsession with martial arts uh, from the age group that I was in because everybody was engrossed in the movies. And yeah, I mean, the Bruce Lee craze, of, of course, blew everything, you know, massively popular. And uh, so it, it, there, there was just a, there was a lot of hub, you know, uh, a lot of yeah. talking and uh, a lot of a lot of uh, activity in that area. And, and it's it's barely changed. We have the same arguments. the The specifics are different. You know, we we probably talk about Muay Thai more now than we did then. And, uh, we're certainly talking about BJJ more now than we did then, but it's the same arguments. Similar. Yep. Huh. You would have thought we would have gotten past that by now. I guess not. Okay. So you, you come back from the international high school, you reconnect with your group and then what? Well, um, I continued, uh, um, it, it was sort of like, a an interesting scenario because, um, I became sort of like the roving kata expert in the group. Mm. Um, I always paid more attention to kata than the kumite. I did kumite. Um, I did fairly well. I wasn't like the best guy. It probably because I just didn't really care for it that much. So, but I was obsessed with kata and I was obsessed with applications because a lot of people were just concerned with the kumite. Um, and because applications weren't really taught, which is a whole nother large subject we can talk about. Um, but I was obsessed with it because I grew up in judo and in judo, you either do it or you don't, you don't, you don't pretend you do it. You either choke, you arm bar, or you throw and you slam and you have to do it. It's not like you can, um, you know, throw to one inch of hitting the mat and suspend it mm. in midair. Like in karate, you're supposed to, you know, pull at one inch and hey, well, I would have hit you if I committed. Um, so there was that kind of a uh, uh, very un unpleasant. Um, it, it was an unfinished product to me, and yeah. and I, I I felt like you know I understand why you can't hit, but I understood the value of these of these punch and strikes. But one of the things that fascinated me is like, well, judo requires all this stuff, and you have to grab enough balance and entry and execute and blah blah blah. But Jesus, if I can just punch you in the nose and knock you out, uh, that's a lot easier than going through the whole judo <laughs> throw thing. So I was fascinated with the strikes in, as to the effectiveness of pugilism and impacting, you know, as a form yeah. of fighting. So that fascinated me just as much as the judo part. Um, and, it, and it just sort of became, uh, you know, okay, here's another another cog in the, you know, in the wheel that I'm, that I'm working with. So it just, sure. it just became the, the, a, a new aspect of obsession. Now I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to guess, I mean, you kind of led us in this direction and, and I know a little bit of your background, so I'm, I'm fairly confident. Hmm. I'm guessing as you started doing kata with this karate group, you started doing some bunkai, the application stuff. And I'm going to guess that at some point you found something in there that was best explained from your judo time rather than your karate time. Well, I, I began to see similarities because at the time, you know, throws were not necessarily considered a part of karate because nobody did them. Sure. If you look at the old Funakoshi books from the early 1920s, there, there are pictures of, you know, him grabbing somebody and there's throws and this and that. But, you know, as, as you begin to see the, the movements of karate and you start to put two and two together, there's things that look exactly like judo throws and applications of karate and you know um, kung fu and it, so it, it it all really is it, it all really boils down to a soup where all the ingredients are put in a uh, blender um but they may come from different disciplines but they appear everywhere and they overlap tremendously it's just yeah. that Back in those days, it was very compartmentalized. Well, in karate, you do this. In judo, you do this. Now it's like, no, you do it everywhere. 
that if you know how to find it and how to apply it. And it sounds like you didn't necessarily accept those hard lines between the two, even in early days. That it, maybe that's retrospect, but that's kind of what I heard in your words. Well, I was always curious as to like why why are the applications so difficult to 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 find out or, or learn. I mean, we all know what happened was you know certain individuals go to the, go to Japan or Okinawa and they come back. They don't know they they train with a very limited time of a few yeah. years they're not taught the the inner works of how the stuff works so they come back and then they have they have a very small partial curriculum but then they fill in the rest with drills and exercises or exotic philosophies to uh, but still you're going through all these kata movements now we know that when you do a punch in a kata or a backfist or a kick we don't have to have anybody interpret what that is. But then what happens when you do a high block or a middle block or a down block or a double-handed movement or the hands are open in this in this posture? None of that was ever explained. Well, except that, yes, uh, you know, if somebody's going to club you over the head, you throw your arm up and that's supposed to be a high block. Or if somebody's punching you in the chest, you, you do what we can call outer block or middle block. Uh, those were sort of like nobody needs that to be explained that anybody can sort of figure that out. But it's sort of like the what you see is what you get. But 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 all these other things that are sort of uh, not 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 that. Uh, well, why why are you doing those movements in the kata? So it always occurred to me that if the katas are so important, then um, what are all these movements for? And there was never an explanation. Because when you went to apply it in the only form that we knew at the time, which was the sports type of kumite, mm. none of that came into play. There were no high blocks. There were no middle blocks. It was just <laughs> sort of like a, a game of tag. And it became a matter of, you know, um, who can bounce around and who can move. Uh, more like a boxing match where you, you know, you, you just bounce around and move and uh, apply reflexes and duck and jive and that kind of thing. So it, it, it was it was like there was just a huge gap missing in what was being taught at that time. And I think it's, it was pretty much across the board. Um, and the, the sad thing is, is that what I believe nowadays is that it wasn't that the, the Americans or other Westerners going to Japan and Okinawa were, were purposely not taught this. Uh, and in a lot of cases, they didn't know it as well either. So, sure. you know, it was... It was a whole, it was really a very interesting discovery, uh, disappointingly so. Yeah. All right. So, so what's coming next? You know, you're, you're, you're the Kata guy. And then, well, I, I what, used, what was the next yeah. thing? Transition. I, I, I bounced around. I, I went to different dojos. I trained with, with, with everybody within our organization. Uh, I enjoyed it. Uh, um, we, we had, we had this, we had this kata, uh, uh, this guy come from South Africa. His name was Hani Sakas. He was a, a Lebanese guy who trained in traditional Okinawan goju ryu in South Africa. He came to Miami, Florida after going to New York and trained with Urban. And he found us through a newspaper ad. And we began to learn the Okinawan versions of the goju ryu kata, which, which we were not doing. We were doing the Peter Urban American goju katas. And that mm. sort of became uh, an enlightenment for me because I always wonder well, what were the Okinawan katas like? And I had no idea what they looked like because there was no YouTube at that time and there were no videos. So, um, How different was it? Oh, like night and day. Really? So it was like night and day. And then all of a sudden, once I, it, it took about six months to, to meet this guy, me and another person from the group. Another person who was interested in kata as much as I was, we met with him on Saturdays every week. And then we finally learned everything from Sanchin to Superempe and in between. And then uh, when I when we started to use those katas in the regular tournaments, tournament circuit in South Florida, it was it was the time when we started to win first place in the hard uh, men's hard style kata. So at that time, there there so there was no traditional Okinawan goju ryu in South Florida at all, none. It was just the urban. It was it was it was just um, it was saturation of Peter Irving goju. Uh, 
And because I was so interested in kata, that's what I participated in. I participated in. And there was a guy from the um, United States Shurite Association. Uh, his name was Andy Horn, who was a fantastic martial artist. He passed away recently, sadly. Um, but he used to continually get first place. So when I first started to use the Okinawa and uh, Goju kata, it was the first time anybody in our group won first place in men's hard style kata. So that sort of started a, a transition where this group started to switch over to do the Okinawan katas. And that was really interesting uh, because all of a sudden there was a whole new interest in what we were doing because nobody had ever seen these katas before. Did this too spark something in the way you were approaching, I guess, the philosophy, the underpinnings of these forms? It did because the movements... uh, the movements were so different, and there was just something about the movements that, that had a little bit more rationality, a little bit more logic. Uh, they, they seemed to have uh, some kind of uh, a reason, potential behind them. Um, so I was starting to just really focus on, on these forms. The group that I was with, a lot of them didn't care for those. So there was two camps. There's some of them who knew the Okinawan Katas. And the other guys continued to do the Peter Urban stuff, but the Peter Urban group was just mostly focusing on on the competition. And I started to grow less and less interested in competition because these katas started to shift me in a different mindset. Um, so eventually, I just sort of grew out of it. And during this time, there was a gentleman named Tim Rogers who would go to the who would go to tournaments from time to time, who eventually became my short and real instructor. And I used to meet with him uh, and talk to him at the tournaments while I was doing the goju. And he used to wear a traditional white gi. And uh, uh, he was just a very exotic individual. Uh, but he would always look at me and he, he, he said, you're different in some way, you know, than a lot of these other guys, especially when I started to do the Okinawa katas. And I would secretly go to him and say, hey, sensei, uh, you know, you do Okinawan Karate, uh, can you give me any pointers? How did I do in my kata? So, you know, we had a very amicable relationship. Um, uh, but, you know, he was from the other camp. He was from a different style. And the Peter Urban group was kind of very, very tribalistic and and such. Uh, so I was sort of like be the, uh, the black sheep who would go talk to these other guys. Um, but eventually, when I grew, when I grew out of the interest of, of the whole complete sports thing, one day I just decided to go, um, and I asked uh, Sensei Rogers, "Can I train with you?" And he says, "Come on in." And after that, you know, that was it. I switched over to uh, Okinawa and Shodan Ryu. Hmm. And what was? Uh, how do I want to say? At this point, you've trained with plenty of people doing different things. And I would imagine you've got enough context to recognize the right home for that step in your training versus um, maybe remaining in your comfort zone. What was it about this new instructor that you said, I, I need to be here. I need to be with him. Well, number one, He was an honest individual with me. He never blew smoke. He always told me the truth. He gave me sound advice. He never tried to switch me over. He never recruited me. He just saw me as for who I was and liked who I was. And he, I mean, I felt like tickled that he would even give me the time of day. So that that was uh, very interesting because I was not part of his group. And, you know, at that time, when you're young and dumb, kind of like, you know, at that age, you know, there, there's this tribalism among martial arts group that was much more so at that time than, than it is today. And, uh, you know, you, you sort of hung out with your crowd and you don't mingle with other, other because they're your competition. You're not supposed to be friendly with them. Um, but so th- the other thing was, is that Tim Rogers was a scary individual. He... He had an air about him. Now, I found out eventually that uh, he did three tours in Vietnam. He, he had been uh, involved in martial arts since he was 12. Um, he, he was uh, 
uh, FDA uh, officer uh, uh, during the, you know, cocaine days in Miami where there were all, all kinds of things going on. So he has seen more action than probably everybody combined and, you know, everybody that I knew at the time. Uh, and he, he knew how to use his karate in a way that I had never seen before. He wasn't playing around. He had, he had, he had a switch. He was either on or off. There was no kumite in his dojo. He did not do kumite. Uh, he did everything possible not to, not to destroy you when he was demonstrating. His blocks and his punches were so hard that I literally, even with my thick, uh, strong bones in my legs, when he would block you, it would feel like, oh, great, he did not fracture my bone this time. <laughs> but the hematomas and the black and blues were so... Uh, it, it would be like, hey, you know what? Mine's bigger than yours. Look at this one. It, 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 it's got, it's got more, <laughs> color, more colors than yours. But you know what? I absolutely love that because it reminded me of the judo days where you had sprained ankles and dislocations and fractures. And, and you know, uh, uh, you had to tape your toes because your toes were, you know, crushed. You know, it was that kind of physicality that I strive for that, that reminded me of my early judo days and that physicality that was missing in in sports karate. Uh, so that, that gave me the realism that I was looking for. Now, even so as good as he was, the applications and the bunkai part was still missing to some degree, not because of his, his uh, un, uh, situation. It's just that, again, it goes back to Okinawa. And then I, I finally, you know, started to see the writing on the wall that the ignorance of this goes back to the source. It wasn't that you know, um, they decided not to teach him. And then I started to realize, wow, there really is a missing link here. So he was a fantastic fighter and he knew a lot more applications than things, but they were sort of like the things you would expect to see without having any deep, true study of applications and, and what happens, you know, underneath the surface. What I'm hearing as we move forward in time is a louder and louder uh, question mm -hmm. brewing for you. And it sounds like you kept looking for the answer and finding pieces, but it sounds like those pieces you were discovering were only fueling the volume of that question. And, and however you want to slice that question, you know, but it, essentially it sounds like it's, it's kata and it's bunkai, it's application within forms. And so at, at risk of fast forwarding through the timetable, let's, let's open it up. At some point you said, I, I, I need a stronger answer. I need to find this information. It sounds like it was a quest for you. How did, how did you, how did you answer this? Because I was able to roam when I was, uh, when, when I was in the urban Goju group, I did a lot of uh, um, exploration that others didn't do uh, because they were just focusing on that. But uh, I visited other dojos. Uh, I even visited uh, some of the Kung Fu instructors in, in the South Florida area. I had a friend of mine who was uh, training in Wing Chun, and I had another friend of mine who was training in Hungar Kung Fu. And I did a lot of exploration with them, and I learned some forms and visited some of the schools. Uh, and of course, at that time, I, I began to collect my, my book collection, which I still have to this day and started to read and find out. So I kind of knew, uh, I understood a lot more about historically what the different martial arts were. And I started to see, wow, the Chinese martial arts have seemed to have a lot of stuff in there that is just, you don't see in the, in the karate books. For example, the, the famous and very well done uh, the Nakayama series of, of Shotokan, uh, the JKA series of little books that had like Heian, Basai, et cetera. And then, uh, they had, uh, they had the, the application books. Those applications were sort of very simplistic, uh, very sort of like a low level, um, uh, application. But then when I would see something coming from the Chinese side, what's all this grappling stuff and what's all this, uh, jujitsu aikido where your hands are being twisted and you're being locked and, and, you know, all these different things. Uh, so there was, it, it seemed like, you know, the, the Chinese, uh, martial arts 
had like 10 pounds worth of application knowledge and history and the Japanese Okinawan side had like a, a couple ounces. So that, that started, that started to point the way, well, I, I need to look more into this Chinese stuff or any art that I could find. Um, I mean, pretty much you, you look at Indonesian Salat, you look at, uh, you know, a, a, any of the Southeast Asian arts, uh, and, and of course, you know, the, the vast history of the, the Chinese martial arts. And then you start to see martial arts systems that are extremely realistic, that have a, that have a tradition of, of knowledge that has not been broken and that the teachings have been maintained. Uh, I mean, we can get into the history of why I think that the uh, Okinawan karate systems, uh, you know, lack this, but, you know, a lot of it has to do with the history, World War II, uh, uh, you know, the, sure. the animosity between the Japanese conquerors and the Okinawans who were conquered and all the secrecy stuff. And uh, there's a whole another chapter there. But, <laughs> it sure is. Probably, and, probably a series of books more so than a chapter. Yeah. But, but basically, uh, uh, and because of my experience in judo, that, I, that I, I, I had a matrix to be able or a primer to be able to understand what made sense to me. Because in judo, it's so simple. You either are thrown or you're not thrown. And, and, and it was black and white for me. You either know what you're talking about or you're just making stuff up or you're, or you're coming up with the excuses. Every single martial artist who grew up in my area has heard this line. The essence of the technique will magically appear after you do it 10,000 times. You will understand the applications. That's one line that you, that we heard or I heard. Another line was, if I teach you the application, because there's so many of them, but if I teach you one, then your mind is going to be locked into one and you will miss out the potential to understand all the other applications. That is a, that is an illogical statement to me. You know, be, because you're going to show me one way, that means that my, that my brain is incapable of, of having an open mind to say, well, there's variation 1.A, 1.B, 1.C. No, I mean, we're capable of understanding that, but that is the excuse that people give when they don't have an answer and they don't want to say, I don't know. And that was always a, a, a reason that so many instructors, because they just didn't want to seem silly and foolish, in front of a bunch of students who ask a question, and instead of saying, I don't know the answer to that, they would say, you're not ready. I'm sure we, yeah. I'm sure you heard that too. I, I have heard that along the way. That doesn't, that, that doesn't mean that, that a teacher cannot say to a student, you're not ready. But they were using, right. it, they were right. using it for a different reason. Not because the right. student wasn't ready and they had the answer and they had the technique. You know, so there's, there's two ways to use that. For sure. Okay. As you discovered stuff, as you started adding these pieces to your toolkit and, and learning more of diverse martial arts and, and, and approaches, which, you know, it, it sounds like we're probably on the same page that they, they have more in common than they do different. Where did this all start to coalesce? I know you're doing some things now with with application and and putting out some content what do you do you feel like you've answered this big question for yourself At this or point, does the question keep getting louder and you keep it's it almost uh and i don't mean this in a disparaging way it reminds me of the way people talk about addiction you know mm -hmm. just keep charging and looking for you know where is the answer here I think I've found what I what I'm looking for at this point. Cool. How would you describe that to people? You know, we we've been on a ride with you today. You know, what what is that what does that answer look like? It's a it's a combination of things. It is finding teachers and styles that this knowledge has been kept intact or as intact as possible. Um, I figured out that it's, it's all the same thing from the perspective that um, when, when, you, when you come across teachers who know and styles that have the answers, the applications are there. Oftentimes, 
They're not clearly visible to the naked eye when you see the forms being done. You can sort of guess what they are. Oftentimes you may guess correctly or you may guess part of it, but you really do need to have somebody explain to you because they're very deceptive. Doing a solo form, it's like seeing a painting. But then when you try to paint and you don't know how to paint, it's going to look really bad. So one step would be you find paint by numbers book. So, you know, it tells you what color to put in this little area. And then you start to figure that out. That is when you're being shown applications. Uh, and you're so when this happens, you do this. When this happens, you do this. That's, that's would be like base level start to get, to get your brain to think, but you can't fight with a predetermined set of outcomes that you have to think about. Well, if he kicks me, I'm going to do this. So it, 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 take, it takes you to a level where you have to sort of be like a jazz artist where you don't know what you're going to do. You just react to it, but your training gives you all the tools that you'll need and they'll come out um, the, the way that you would use a, a database query where all the elements are spread out individually. But uh, when, you, when you open up a web page, all these elements show up in this pretty picture. Uh, so you have all the tools, you have everything. I know I, I diverted a little bit from that's from, a, from the that's original okay. question. That's okay. Uh, the questions I ask are really irrelevant. It's it's your yeah. answers that are what's most important. But w- what you did in there, you actually gave the two best um, defenses against people who say forms are, are irrelevant. And the first one being paint by number. This idea that painting by number is the end of your artistic education. And that if you paint by number, you're not an artist because, you know, there, there's there's nothing, you know, you haven't done anything more. Well, well, in a sense, yeah, but it's meant to be a tool along the way and kind of, you know, you, you talked about it as jazz. It would be like ending it, learning how to play scales. Exactly. Until you can put it together. And, you know, I, I'm sure I don't even have to ask. I'm sure you're you're as... Um, uh, frustrated, maybe, uh, as I am with people who point to forums and say that they're pointless because people will pick out these certain aspects, you know, they're remaining in the paint by number or the musical scale level and assuming that that's all there is. Well, the interesting thing is, is that we have people doing martial arts by the millions. I don't think martial arts, martial, well, my teacher would say karate is for everybody, but not everybody's for karate. And I, and I believe that okay. or, 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 or martial arts in general, because there are, there are people who just cannot put this puzzle together. And no matter how hard you try, their brain is just not wired to go that extra step where you can just really become that jazz artist that can react without thinking. That, that, that's when the whole uh, motion thing comes in in Japanese philosophy where you know mind and, you know, the Tom Cruise uh, samurai movie where you just empty out your mind and then your stuff comes out. Um, there's a lot of people who remain stuck in paint by the numbers. Now, don't get me wrong, paint by the numbers. If, this, if they do this, you do this, that you can still defend yourself to, to a fairly good degree. It, it, stuff will still come out of you instinct, instinctually but you're very, very limited in what you can do. And if the situation changes slightly, then you don't know how to go along with it. So for example, a jazz artist, you know, if the drummer changes the beat, then the guitarist has to listen to the drummer and then everybody has to sort of go along. That's the same thing. If you expect a, an attack to come in one direction and you're ready for it, but then the guy switches and does something else. If you don't know how to dance and, and, and go along and switch to what he's doing, then you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna get stuck. You're gonna get defeated, or or you're gonna fail at what you tried to do. Um, so it, it it is an evolutionary step where you go paint by numbers and and to the point where you can just say to somebody, "Well, punch me in the head, and I'm gonna show you what I'm gonna do." Okay, and then you say to them, "Hit me, and I'll show you what I do." That means you're ready to take anything on. You, sure. you you don't have to have preparation. You don't have to have any 
any, uh, you know, coordination or, or choreography, th that's when you get to a level that you are confident that whatever happens, you got plenty of tools in your toolbox uh, to take care of it. Hmm. For sure. So why don't you tell us about what you're doing now? I know you've got some cool stuff happening. I'd love to hear about it. I met with, um, I met with this uh, Chinese Kung Fu group uh, with, a, with a teacher, uh, James Walters is somebody that I met in, in the nineties when I was doing uh, Bugesha magazine. And uh, they practice this uh, Chinese system that's very interesting. And uh, I have found that there's no lack of knowledge or any, in any of the areas of knowledge. And it's been a very interesting ride because um, I, I hooked up with him in 2019 before COVID. Um, when I visited uh, Southern California um, to see my wife's parents, and that got me interested back into what he does. Um, and he taught me uh, Okinawan form called Shinsu. And that got me very interested because it was the first time ever that I learned a complete form and was given um, a primer to understand the applications, um, a whole set of, of, of theories and lesson plans for that form, what it was supposed to teach you. Um, and then we spent uh, about five hours that evening going through every, uh, every application, the, the, the meridians, the points, the, the, the dim mark, the, uh, uh, you know, it, it was like, wow, I, I, I took about, you know, 15, 20 pages of notes and, what it, what it started to do, it started to really give me the, the uh, ability to start putting all this stuff together in a way that I had never had the opportunity because I have plenty of books about Denmark and the meridians and the points and all that. And trying to memorize that out of context is like reading a dry, boring medical book where you have to memorize uh, medical procedures. But when you learn the applications and the points, and, and what they do, then every single time you go through that kata, you you know, when I do this, that's what I'm hitting here, I'm hitting here, I'm hitting here. And then the ability to memorize the points, the ability to understand what the, what the effects are becomes a much more uh, easier process to sort of start to understand. Now, that is still sort of painting by the numbers, but what it does, it gets you to learn what the points are. Um, so every time you do a down block, you could be hitting spleen 10 in the inner thigh, not necessarily blocking a kick. So every time you look at the inner thigh, okay, I know, I know that point and I know what it does. It'll collapse your leg and you'll drop. Um, so you start to put these things together in such a way that it makes it so much easier um, if, you, if you have the ability to sort of comprehend and, and put all these pieces together. So that has been a tremendous... Um, um, next step up. But what I found with this group is that their forms are just phenomenal in that it, everything they do is covered under this umbrella of a complete uh, package of understanding from every angle because there's throws, there's locks, there's breaks, there's tears, there's um, the entire package of understanding the meridian points and the dim mock and, and what kills and what maims and, and what hurts you after a few days and how this affects the, the different organs of the body. And geez, once, once you get this knowledge in your head, um, what I tell people is like, you're not, you're not anymore shooting uh, blindly arrows to try to hit the side of a barn at 100 paces. You know, some of the arrows will hit, some of them will go over and miss. Once, once you understand this knowledge, then you become a trained sniper, and you don't have to waste arrows. Every strike you make is hitting a specific area and you know what it's going to happen and, and, and what it's going to do. So there's no guessing anymore. There, there's, 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 a, there's a tremendous amount of wasted effort and, and energy that is no longer uh, draining your resources. So you, be, you become a much more efficient martial artist. Of course, with this knowledge comes the, the confidence that you gain uh, on your skills and your ability to perform. So that makes you a better martial artist because you're going to be much more effective than when you sort of knew what you were doing, but you weren't sure. And sometimes you're lucky, sometimes you're not. Um, 
it's a much better state of mind to be in um, when when you have a, a, a deeper understanding of what it is you're doing, so that so that you can you know be highly focused in the outcome. Hmm. Very cool. If people want to start getting into this stuff, I mean, you, you've got you, you have you have some of this stuff online, don't you? Well, I. I started a project called One Minute Bunkai, um, which was uh, a bunch of little videos uh, that I do in uh, in usually under a minute. Um, it's on YouTube. It's called One Minute Bunkai, and uh, that was an effort for me to share some information with some of my uh, 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 brothers in my organization. Uh, but I, I ended up just putting putting it online because. Um, I, I, I just figured, let's just share it with everybody. Um, so that, that has been a, an interesting project um, where I try to do applications that are not necessarily what you see um, that is commonly thought of. I, I, try to, I try to do things that, that are a little bit differently uh, portrayed. So, for example, there's one that I show of a high block. You look at most karate books, a high block is when you get punched in, in the nose. I show a high block that is actually a very effective and very uh, very dynamic throw where you basically throw the guy on, on his butt. Um, well, how do you do that with a high block? Well, <laughs> that's, the, that's, the, that's the thing that I try to do because I don't want to rehash what other, other uh, YouTube channels were where, where, where somebody shows the same application. I mean, what's the point of me doing what, what has been done in the past? So... I try to look at these things from a different point of view and show it from how I perceive it that sometimes it it is not what what you see is what you get. Sometimes there's a a completely different way of 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 looking at it. Okay. And you've got something else that you're you're working on that that personally I'm I'm pretty pumped about that uh listeners might be surprised cuz it's uh the magazine. Well, <clears throat> I started uh, working on Bugesha in 1996. Um, it ran for two years, and we had uh, seven issues. Uh, it was a traditional martial arts magazine. We tried to do something that was not uh, what Black Belt and others were doing, which, uh, you know, you had uh, Hollywood movie stars, semi-martial artists, and, of course, Bruce Lee on every other cover. <laughs> Not that there's anything wrong with having Bruce Lee, but it's like we weren't going to do that. We wanted to do something more traditional uh, with, uh, you know, the, the traditional characters and, and history. Uh, so that magazine lasted for a couple of years. The, the trouble with the magazine the printing industry, especially in coverage of martial arts, is that there's, no, there's very little money to be made because uh, mm -hmm. there's, there's hardly any advertising. <clears throat> so we tried to go as long as we could. and. Um, uh, it, it ended with issue number six and then issue number seven was never published. So it's been around there and uh, out in PDF format here and there, but uh, I decided to, um, bring it back because I should have done it a long time ago, but, um, I'm a graphic designer by trade. So I do a lot of work with other clients and I put their books up on Amazon and it occurred to me, why don't I bring Bugesha back and I can self publish in Amazon. And basically what it took a team of about 10 people to do, I can do myself. So that's what I started to do at the beginning of, uh, actually the first issue came out in uh, late uh, uh, 2020. So um, I'm working on issue number four right now, uh, cool. which will be uh, uh, coming out in early September. Nice. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure as, a, well, are, are you taking advertising? If there are people listening who want to support this in some way, um, I, am, they... I am I am working on uh, an advertising uh, rate sheet. Uh, uh, I have been working with uh, some advertisers uh, who are uh, people that I've worked with in the past. Um, but yeah, it's um, I'll take advertising uh, at it, you know, <laughs> in any form that it comes. Um, what one of the uh, modes of working is like. Uh, I, I barter for editorial. So if if you're um, if you're a, a, an author, 
If you give me a story, I give you ad space. So you can promote yourself, your school, your products and services. And, um, you know, they get recognition. They get put out there on the, on the world stage. And, uh, and I give them some advertising. But I do have some other advertisers that are, that are paying for ads. Um, but uh, the interesting thing is, is like I, I, I work on a PDF format. I upload it to Amazon, and Amazon does the entire distribution. So this is not a subscription-based magazine, which is very different than the traditional model. If it was a subscription-based magazine, I would have to, it would have to survive, survive on ad sales, which is very hard to do on your first issue because then you have to subsidize that with your own money. So mm -hmm. what I decided to do is I'm just going to put them on Amazon, and if whoever wants to buy it, they order it. Amazon prints it, ships it to you. You pay for the shipping. I get my little cut, and everybody's happy. So it's an interesting uh, new way of distributing a magazine. Very cool. Very cool. Uh, what's the website for that? It is bugeisha.net. B-U-G-E-I-S-H-A dot net. And you mentioned One Minute Bunkai on YouTube. Any other links, any social media or email or websites that, that people should know for you? Um, well, there's, um, I do have a Facebook page uh, for um, uh, for Bugeisha that, uh, let me see what the URL is. Or either that, or I can give you all this stuff and you can link it. Um, yeah, yeah, let's do that. I know we have some of these links, but I've got a feeling that there are more that we don't have. So if you can send those over to listeners, we're going to make sure that we put this up in the show notes. Uh, yeah. I'm sure most of you know, but it's whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Yeah. yeah, as far as uh, anything that's sort of like social and um, and commercial, it would be, well, the one minute bunkai uh, is just a, an offering of, um, you know, what what I do, uh, but the um, uh, the Bugesha magazine has its, has its own website, which explains a little bit about the magazine, and it points to all the Amazon links so that you can see uh, whatever issue you want to look for, including the first seven issues are in one massive 450-page collector's edition, so oh, that cool. if you don't have them, you can either get that or you can buy them individually. Uh, but then every every time I have a new one, it gets posted on bugeisha.net. So you can go there, you can kind of get a little bit of a preview of what the stories are like, and then it takes you directly. So it is sold in a printed uh, color version, um, and, you know, glossy cover, uh, beautiful inside color. And then there's a black and white version with a color cover, black and white interior, which costs a little bit less. And then there's a Kindle version. Um, and I wanted to definitely include a Kindle version because Amazon publishing uh, doesn't cover the entire world. Like they don't, ha they don't have the, they're like South America is not covered, but the Kindle, anybody can purchase anywhere. Well, that, that's great. That's great. I, I, the more people <clears throat> doing stuff like this, the more people providing content, quality content to serve the traditional martial arts industry in, in various ways. You know, we, we've, we've gone on record, you know, to, say that you know we, we support everybody even the people who look like they're competing with us you know we try to support them you know we'll have other podcasters on the show whatever possible because hey you know whether whether you look at it as rising tide lifts all ships or the cream rises to the top you know it doesn't really matter you know we're all in this stuff together we're all trying to help each other get better yeah. as martial artists cool now we've got a lot of people listening, different backgrounds, different times in training wise, and we've covered a lot of stuff today. But if you were to leave everyone off with kind of a, you know, some final thoughts, what would those be? If you're not getting what you're looking for, look somewhere else. Don't don't be satisfied with half answers or half truths. Uh, the answers are out there. They may not be easy to find. Uh, but we have to get away from this tribalism of my style is better than your style or my teacher is better than your teacher. I mean, everybody's a human being. There is nobody that, th th there are people who have more highly developed talents than others. Yes, there's some teachers that can do some things. But the point is, wherever you are, at whatever state you are, with whatever teacher you have, as long as your teacher is doing the best he can with the knowledge that he has, hey, bravo. And we applaud that, that effort. Um, but not everybody has all the answers. Um, so, you know, if, if you, if you, if you find that something is lacking, 
uh, I'm not saying leave your teacher and, and run away somewhere else, but don't be afraid to open up a book. Don't be afraid to visit other dojos. Don't be afraid to, you know, uh, cross train or, or look at YouTube or, or, or buy books, you know, get the answers you want, because in the end, all this stuff is all the same. The, 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 the things that separate martial arts are borders, culture, uh, ge geographical locations, language, and, 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 and let's call it race. But the martial arts are all the same. Once you remove all those things, karate, aikido, kung fu, jiu-jitsu, they, they are all parts of the same body of knowledge that is the entire, uh, the, the complete entirety of martial arts. So, don't get bogged down in your style. Love your style, respect it, be faithful, you know, but understand that it may have limitations, not necessarily the style, but maybe the teacher or the organization. I mean, a, a clear example is what I did. It's like, I wasn't interested in sports karate, so what am I doing in a sports karate group? I started to look for traditional teachers, and then that got me going at least in the right direction. And then from there has been one complete path of, going from one traditional organization to another to another to another and then they all had little different things and it and it and it starts to put the pieces of the puzzle where i had a semi-completed puzzle and then every time i go somewhere else i get a few more pieces and then i can complete the, the, the puzzle the more your puzzle is complete then you start to see what the image is supposed to be because but if you have pieces missing all over the place you know you have a partial vi visual of what the art is supposed to give you so don't be afraid, you know, go out and explore because uh, I'm 61 years old and I hear the clock ticking. You know, do I, do I have another 10 years where I can do this stuff? Um, there's no time to waste. And, you know, if, if you're much younger, don't waste your time. If you're not happy with what you're doing, uh, find something else. I said in the intro that today's conversation left me asking questions. And you might not think that's a positive thing, but then again, if you know me, you know that that's about the highest compliment I could give. I really appreciate you coming on the show, Sensei Lemus, and just really kind of letting go, just like hitting us with the reality of these various points in your life and all the wonderful knowledge that you've gleaned. I, I felt like I was on the journey with you. So thanks for coming on. I'm sure we'll talk again. Listeners, I hope you check out the things that he's working on. I hope you check out the YouTube channel. I hope you check out the magazine. You know, these are great things. I am always up for supporting other martial artists doing cool martial arts stuff. And that's part of why we brought him on the show, because we wanted you all to see the cool stuff that this man is doing. So check it out. If you want to check out the links, you know, we talked about quite a few places today. Go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com or check out the show notes. It's probably in your podcast app. And you can see all the places you can go to check out Sensei's work. You can also check out all our stuff at whistlekick.com. Don't forget the code PODCAST15 gets you 15% off. And you can check out our training programs at whistlekickprograms.com, whether it's the strength program or the conditioning program or the speed development program or the flex program, which, by the way, is free. You can check out all those things. If you want to support us, anything that seems to make sense, just go ahead and do that. We appreciate it. If you want to write to me, jeremy at whistlekick.com. Our social media is at whistlekick. That's it. So until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. Bye.